You're an anointing for all these things by your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Okay. If you have Bibles, you may want to read along here, look along with me in Daniel chapter 4. This is a story of a Bible principle to the nth degree. And we're going to we're going to look at Daniel 4 and Daniel chapter 5 tonight. We're going to see how how historically accurate these things are. It's amazing what we know about this time period of ancient Babylon from secular sources and from the Word of God. And they match they match wonderfully wonderfully well. Archaeology does does uh, helps bring this whole thing to life. But we see Nebuchadnezzar the king. Of all people, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is telling this story. If you will, this is his second conversion experience. Uh, because he's, he already has realized, you know, previously that the God of Daniel is the, the Lord of Lords and God of Gods. But he, <laughs> he, he needs a little adjustment here. So, uh, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought towards me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion from generation to generation. This is an amazing proclamation for a man who a few years earlier was an idol worshiper. For him to make this kind of declaration he has seen an all powerful God in action through Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And he, uh, he is proclaiming the truth that he has accepted and believed. Nebuchadnezzar is a great story. Uh, he was an ill tempered tyrant. And God revealed himself to him repeatedly, and he comes to this conclusion. But we're going to show you what the settling factor was to bring him to this place of, of, of faith in this way. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, and the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and I took the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Now it's time to call Daniel. <laughs> and interesting here, his, we've mentioned this, his Babylonian name, Belteshog. Bel was the name of the chief god in Babylon. And so they named him after the chief god in Babylon. But Daniel represents the chief god of the universe. And now, a little tricky with Bel as God, he, sometimes his name is Marduk, and sometimes Bel, and they are the same deity. Why he has a double name, I do not know. But, but it's there. So when you see Marduk, you see Bel, it was the main god, they considered the most important god, but they, they worshipped many gods. They were idolaters. They had many gods. So, but at last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshoff, according to the name of my god, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshoff, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubles thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. So I'm going to try to pitch this a little bit for you, what he saw. Thus were the visions of my head and my bed. I saw, behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. This is a huge tree. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the ends of the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, the fruit thereof much, and it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow in it, the fowls of the heaven dwelt in its boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. So he sees this tremendous tree. I saw in the visions of my head upon the bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said thus, 
you down the tree, cut off the branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit, let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Trees coming down. Nevertheless, leave the stump of the roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass. Now we talked about iron and brass. Remember, they always symbolize captivity, slavery, bondage, uh, imprisonment, because that's what they were used, used for. In particularly brass for judgment, iron for captivity, or being a slave to something. In the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the field. <laughs> and let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomsoever he will, and sets up over it the basis of men. This statement here is the theme of chapter 4, and it is also the theme of chapter 5. They have identical themes, but they are different stories. Now, they're important stories. So the thing is going to be a whole chapter illustrating the same idea, but different stories that really took place. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now, thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, forasmuch as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation. But thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. You notice his frame of reference? His frame of reference is from idolatry, that there are many gods, but, you know, he, he's got the, you know, the greatest wisdom of them. He still has that framework, that way of thinking. That's his origin. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for an hour. This is interesting. For a whole hour, he would not say a thing to the king. He knew what the dream was about, but he he struggled to, to, to actually say what was going to happen. This was, if you will, Daniel did not want to make this prophecy. Daniel loved this king, and he could see what was coming, and he struggled before he opened his mouth and said anything. So he sat for an hour, astonished, not saying anything. So he finally says, let not the dream or the interpretation of trouble thee. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's going to trouble him. Belteshazzar answered and said, my Lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. And he's saying, I'm going to tell you what this means, but I wish it wasn't about you. I wish it was something else or someone else. So he struggles with this thing. Uh, the tree that you saw, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and of it was meat for men under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon those branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king. What's he saying? Nebuchadnezzar, you are that tree. <laughs> okay? That are grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And thereas the king saw the watcher and the holy one come down from heaven, saying, You down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, and the tender leaf of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the field to seven times pass over him. Now the interpretation came is a decree of the Most High, which came upon the Lord King, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling place shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as an ox, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, 
and gives it to whomsoever he will. The theme is repeated. You, king, are going to be given the mind of an animal. And you are going to eat your cut, if you will. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to chew grass and have the mind of an animal for seven years. That is his prophecy, and that's why he was, if you will, terrified to have to give it to the king, and he's hoping that the king can do something to prevent it. That's what he's hoping for. Well, watch how he does this. And whereas thy commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou hast known that the heavens do rule. Nebuchadnezzar was king for 43 years. Just a little bit about the time span of his kingdom. The first, so the first, at least the first two or three years of his kingdom, he was co-regent with his father. But he was the king, if you will, that actually invaded Israel. His father was in, was in Babylon at the time. But he was co-regent. They shared the power of the kingdom. But during this 43-year period of time, and we don't know the exact years, he, he was, you know, if you will, off the throne and in the field and had an animal's mind for seven years. And then the kingdom was restored to him. And this is, this is what Daniel's speaking about here. Where of? Here's his counsel. You know, he sees the future, hoping that the king can do something to avoid this prophecy from coming true. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. He said, you know, live righteously, now, abandon any sin, uh, give gifts to the poor, show mercy, and that hopes that this, you know, that this will not happen, or that we can postpone this thing from happening. At the, now, here we get in verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. 12 months later, he is going to be snared by his words. Now, if you're taking notes, let me just, you're going to see this in two chapters here. There is pride in all of our hearts in different ways. Even a person who, who always, you know, says, oh, I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing. Sometimes they take pride in being a nobody and a nothing, and they're still proud. I, you know, there's all, pride has its form, and there are so many that we can imagine all of them. But uh, <laughs> when the proud words finally come from the heart, and go out of the mouth. At that moment, judgment is set for those proud words by God. By your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be what, folks? Condemned. Oh, Jesus said that, didn't he? Okay, now we've got an example of it. We're going to watch the proud words come out, and it's astonishing how, the, how quickly the judgment comes. So, the king is in his, 12 months later, he's in his palace, and here's what he says. Is not this great Babylon that I have built. Now that's true. He historically is credited with Babylon had different periods of glory and he really, if you will, rebuilt the city. He added, I, I just found this the other night, he added a third wall to the double wall. And one and he had an, an outer wall besides the two double inner walls. And you know he fortified this city. He made it glorious. Uh, some of you know, you've heard stories about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. There are archaeologists says, yes, we found the hump of rubble that was the hang Hanging Gardens. Others say, no, it never existed. Uh, you know, there's no mention of it in the scriptures. Is it possible? Yes. So, I don't know, but it was a glorious city. The ancients considered the, the Babylon, the Hanging Gardens, and the wall of Babylon at different times as one of the seven wonders of the world. There was nothing like it. Uh, on the planet. So, this king, king says, you know, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power <laughs> and for the honor of my majesty? Except who gave him that power? And we know that. He's forgetting that by grace he was raised up to this position. And it was grace that he was, the, he, that all this greatness took place and he had the wealth and the power and the wisdom to do these things. While the word was in the king's mouth. Well, that's not very long, is it? There fell a voice from heaven saying, 
O King Nebuchadnezzar, a voice from heaven. This guy got grace. Like, I don't know if anybody in the Bible got more grace. Maybe David. Maybe. But God dealt with this man so personally and so strongly and so wonderfully. This is unusual. When we say proud words, we don't usually get a voice from heaven uh, to correct us. Maybe you have your wife do it. I don't know. You know, it depends. Here we go. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. I'm wonderful. I'm great. I built Babylon. Oh, no, you're not. Immediately. The words come. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee. We see it again here. Until thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomsoever he will. We've seen that statement how many times? Three times already. Yeah, that's what he's, that's the lesson. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. Nice. <laughs> At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that lived forever. After seven years, he comes to his right mind, and he realized that he has been humbled by God. So, this is our story. To him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand and say unto him, What doeth thou? He's learned a great lesson. At the same time my reason returned to me. For the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counsels of my Lord sought me. And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. The Babylonian kingdom had no greater king than Nebuchadnezzar. The, the next the king to rule in that Babylonian line, the next king who ruled you know, anywhere near as long as 43 years was, was a king that ruled for 17. And really, after Nebuchadnezzar, the empire begins to crumble. The rulers do not have the same wisdom or authority that he had. It, 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 you know, from Nebuchadnezzar, we see this downward spiral of the Babylonian Empire, which lasted only, I think, it's 80-something years, the whole time, very short for a kingdom. If the kings after him had learned from Nebuchadnezzar's example in these stories, that kingdom would have been prolonged much longer. But they soon returned to idolatry after all these revelations of God. And so the quick kingdom was quickly removed. Huh. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, what's it say folks? He is able to what? Abase. Abase. A base. Uh, does this take him a long time to do this? <laughs> it can be. It can be very, 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 very fast. I have this thing in my household. My wife and I have one common characteristic. We are both wonderful at losing things. So the question comes up: When you lose something, whose fault is it? And so I have this. We have. I have this rule that's never been broken in my house. Whenever I blame my wife for losing something, it turns out that it was my fault. When I keep my mouth shut, I do much better, much much better. So I've learned: don't open your mouth. It's going to be. You're going to find it in your pocket. You know. Yeah. So it's just a thing I've learned. I like. It's like I eat my words all the time at home. And I, I think many times when we are proud words, God has us swallow very quickly. So, this is our story. Now, I wanted to give you a more contemporary story of someone speaking proud words, and immediately, immediately, there's a change, and they're humble. So, 
Is this not football season? There we go. Alright, oh. Those that walk in pride, he's able to abase. Woo! Okay. Now, uh, now, I may, I may have to get through a few slides here. I'm going to skip here for a minute. Oh, you know, we are told to pray, to fast, to give in what? Secret. So that no proud words come out of our mouth. That's the purpose of it. Okay? And our testimony should be 1 Corinthians 15.10. I am what I am by the what? Grace of God. By the grace of God. Okay? <laughs> by the grace of God. And we really mean it. Uh, and we sometimes we have to experience things where things we know how to do and we're good at we we some one day we can't seem to do them and have to actually pray. So I get, I, I I need to give new grace. I need grace even to do what I know how to do. And we get to that place. God wants us at that place. And then in Proverbs twenty seven one and two, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And here it is. This is what Nebuchadnezzar did not do. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth. Oh, this is Babylon that I have built. No, no, no. Leave that for someone else. Leave that for the historians. You keep quiet. By the grace of God, we've got this wall up today. Amen. That's how it should be. And a stranger and not thine own lips. So, here we are. How many remember Thurman? Thomas. The Therminator. You remember the Therminator? Okay, we're going to give you the history of the Therminator here in the Super Bowl. Star halfback for the Buffalo Bells. Okay? And they went to the went to the Super Bowl how many times? Four in a row. Did they win any of those? No. This is big history if you're a Buffalo fan. So look at the look at the sports illustrated here. Super Bowl 25. Ooh, the Terminator is there. Anyways, now, in Super Bowl 25, Thomas has an outstanding performance. He rushes for 135 yards and a touchdown. He catches five passes for 55 yards. If his team has won, he would have been the most valuable player. But his team did not win. Some of you remember that field goal at the end of the game? The Giants all holding hands on the sidelines, praying that the guy would miss. And the camera's watching all these grown men praying as hard as that one could ever pray. Do you remember that? Yeah. What they didn't show you is most of the guys on the other side of the field were also praying. <laughs> I read up on this thing, you know. So that's, that's, and you know, after that, they, they, they put rules on when and when you couldn't pray uh, during football games. The NFL didn't like it. It got too religious for them, you know. Anyways, but that's that's the game. So they lose the first Super Bowl, but he's been to the Super Bowl, and he has been a super player. They return the next year. But, be, who is that there? Who's that basketball player? Michael Jordan. Air Jordan, Michael Jordan. They asked him a question about Michael Jordan before Super Bowl Twenty Six. Are you ready for your question? Here we go. Do you think you are the Michael Jordan of football? They asked him this question. Guess what's going to come out of his mouth, folks? Proud words. Here it is. I am very confident of my abilities. Yes, I do think I'm the Michael Jordan of football. I heard that on radio the day he made that statement. And I was in tears. I said, they're going to lose. They're going to lose. Why did he have to say that? Oh, he's jinxed. I, I know the minute that came out of his mouth, he was in trouble. Do you remember hearing this? Yeah, some of you do. So, what happens in Super Bowl 26? Oh, first the scripture. But he gives more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. Kenneth Weiss translates that God stands in, in what would you call it, um, in battle array against the proud. In what? In battle array against the proud. So, here we have the promise. Uh, he thinks he's the Michael Jordan of football. All right? And he goes for his next Super Bowl. Oh, I've got a Hungarian there. You don't need that. <laughs> when pride comes, then comes what, folks? Shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. And in Job 40, 12, look on everyone who is proud. And bring him low. Oh. How many get brought low who are proud? Everyone. 
There's no exception to this. Not just Christians, not just secular, unsaved, but everyone falls into this thing. Okay. So, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but these are the words of Jesus. We mentioned them already in verse 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Here we go. This time playing against the Washington Redskins. Super Bowl 26. Here's the Terminator. Thomas is noted for a mishap in Super Bowl 26. Thomas had a pre-game ritual where he placed his helmet on the 34-yard line because his number was 34. Yeah, he's put his helmet out there. You know. does, does that sound proud to anybody? I don't know. Anyway, that's what he did. His helmet was moved in order for the stage to be set up for Ray Connick Jr. performance of the National Anthem. Somebody moved his helmet. And when the game started, they could not find his helmet. He's running around looking for his helmet, and he's supposed to be out there being the star halfback. It was no great loss. Because during the game, he would, win, he would gain a total of 13 yards. That's about me to the uh, Jerry there. Yeah, that's about third. That's as far as he went in the whole Super Bowl. They took him out the second half. He was doing that bad. He caught four passes for 27 yards. Dismal. That's what he became famous for. <laughs> Finding his what? Helmet. His helmet. So he went from being a superstar in Super Bowl 25, then come out the proud words, and the next Super Bowl, he can't find his helmet. And it's off the field. And when he finds it, that was worse than when he couldn't find it. So, he's got two more Super Bowls to go. Oh, bad gets worse, folks. Super Bowl 27 against the Dallas Cowboys. Here we go. For a second year in a row, Thomas had a dismal performance in the Super Bowl. He scored the first points of the game for his team on a two-yard touchdown run. Woo! but was limited to 19 rushing yards on 11 carries, four receptions for 10 yards. Oh, in Buffalo, oh, 52 to 17 against Dallas. He also committed a costly fumble that converted into a Dallas touchdown. Now, he was, it says here he was recovering from a hip injury, literally wasn't himself. He has one more shot at it. Super Bowl 28. Thomas has yet another disappointing Super Bowl performance. This time we're getting beat by the Cowboys again. 37 rushing yards, 16 carries. Now, here's the, let me just read the end here. The second, he fumbles twice, which cost them dearly. The second fumble came at the start of the second half, and it was returned for a game-tying touchdown that swung the momentum for the Cowboys. Now, I actually, I wish that they took him off the YouTube. I had some clips I used to show of him. He really was a great running back. He was really very good. Until he opened his mouth and said, I am the Michael Jordan of football. Proud words. I mean, you know, he went from, you know, not a whole lot different than Nebuchadnezzar. You know, they weren't eating the same things, but they were performing the same way. Okay? Now, because we're on football, I, and we want to do things by, not by works, not by righteousness, but by grace. I have a grace song for you. Are you ready for this? Okay, I don't know if you're going to be able to hand this or not. Oh, one, I just, I had to put this in too. I'm sorry I said you were proud. Just what? Stop. One of those things with pride is that when we get proud, we don't listen to people. And we think we know something, so we don't hear what other people are saying to us. And the pride comes before the fall. Someone did a nice job in a cartoon. I want to close this for a minute here. Let's see, we need to get some things up here for you.